three. Is that what's wrong like with you? Love some wood. <laughs> Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. I'm still Ian with Full Throttle Battery. <laughs> and today we join you for episode 14 of the Off Road Podcast, uh, recording April 28th, early in the morning, because we have a special guest with us. Uh, he is the OG uh, Urban Assault Shredder from Southern California with over two and a half million views on that vi- video alone. Uh, he's racked up a, a, an awesome resume of off road experience, and he runs the, with his partner Aaron, run the Shreddy Life uh, online and apparel brand. Uh, uh, he has multiple vehicles and uh, business aspects that have taken him around the world from Vegas to the sand dunes of Qatar. Uh, he has a lot of interesting stories, a lot of uh, interesting perspective, and we're excited to have Blake Wilkie on the uh, call today with us. Blake, how you doing? Cruising, man. Cruising. Morning. The Shred Ambassador. So, uh, Blake, you're joining us from your home this morning. Uh, what's going on uh, there and, and how you doing? Good, man. I know the boys are uh, at the shop grinding. Uh it is early morning, but they had some cars that needed to get 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 out. So, just doing this from home before I roll in there and start start going through my waves of the day. I got a laundry list that seems to always keep growing, but uh, we'll we'll start checking some things off after we check this one off. Awesome. So uh, you're talking about the shop. Uh, kind of give us a little bit of background on who you are, uh, what kind of operation you're running there, and what you do day to day. I mean, the day-to-day is always changing, man, but uh, pretty much uh, at the shop, I, I we build, maintain, and uh, I do personally a lot of stuff for myself and smaller odds and end jobs that are kind of in and out just because um, that's kind of the way that I got to keep the wheels turning. If I have big, long, drawn-out projects, it's harder to collect and get those in and out the door, especially if I have my assets that need to come in and fill a couple of those spots that need to be prepped. But uh the day-to-day is just a steady grind to, you know, please sponsors, make sure that all my my assets are 100% as much as possible. And uh, yeah, just get out there and have fun with it, man. So what kind of operations are going alongside in the side in the shop? I know you got a number of guys working in there. Kind of how does that operate? Are they like employees of yours or do you have other guys that just share the shop space or... Yeah, so there's three of us. It's Timmy Boy, it's Kevin with Quixotic, and then myself. I have like a one to two car spot, depending on what those other guys got going on there. It's 3,300 square feet. Um, we have a little outdoor area where we have, you know, just little break times on our pit bikes and set up ramps and, and whatnot. But uh, um, if we need to help each other out, you know, it's nice to have extra hands on there. Um, I do have a couple friends that when it gets hectic, you know, I'll call my boy Cowboy or Joe or whatnot and be like, yo, come down and buy pizza and maybe a couple of beers and, and we'll get some stuff handled. It's it's hard to uh it's hard to to definitely have a full time employee that, that a lot goes into that. So luckily I have some pretty solid friends that I can I can lean on from time to time if if we do get a little overwhelmed, you could say. Gotcha. And this isn't a shop that like people just walk into and ask for you guys to do custom fab work, right? This is something that you guys primarily, for the most part, have uh, dedicated projects you guys are working on. Um, we have we have clientele that 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 will walk in, you know, or hit us up via Instagram or whatnot. Uh, social media is a powerful tool, and we showcase a lot of stuff that we do. Um, so it depends, you know. There's definitely it's it's fabrication. There's anything from from boats that come in the golf carts to kids quads that need new front bumpers. Cause they're <laughs> just running into stuff. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's always something, there's always something new coming in there and it's, it's cool because it's so versatile. It's not cookie cutter stuff, which can definitely bite you in the butt when you quote stuff. But, uh, yeah, it's always different. That's for sure. So uh, when we're talking about the the shop and, and Instagram being a powerful tool, do you think the operation that you're running today would be possible without social media? Like, how does that? I mean, over the, you're you're old enough to know that before social media, this was a different world, right? And um, going into kind of your ventures and how things have evolved over time, uh, do you think this would be a completely different thing you're running uh, without social media? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it is the new, I guess you could say newspaper or magazine or, 
um, quick form of entertainment. I mean, cable TV is something I haven't had for 12 plus years because I was always out in the garage and I didn't have the time to sit down with my ADD and watch the TV programming unless it was Supercross, you know, or something of that nature. So now with this kind of taking taking shape more so than some of those other forms of, of media back in the day, this is the hub for, you know, younger generations or people that are on the go. It's, it's quick, it's easy, it's accessible, it's informative. It depends on what you're looking for, but it's all at your fingertips. Our phones are so capable nowadays. It's kind of scary sometimes, but um, social media is, I feel like the most powerful form of marketing on, uh, on the planet today. Blake, if you would uh, kind of touch on uh, your fabrication background, kind of where you picked up that skill set. It all started kind of in my dad's garage. The first time we ever made anything out of metal, it was uh, it was actually a piece of rebar that we heated up, beat it flat, sharpened it, and the backside, and we made a knife with a, a custom wooden handle. So, um, you know, it's cool because the backside had kind of like that serrated uh, rebar because he, he basically ties – steel and pools and uh, he's done that his whole life so super hard work and kind of uh yeah kind of cool how that kind of played into a lot of it but he taught me how to weld on some bike ramps and stuff in the garage with uh, a stick welder and all that good stuff and then um kind of sparked my interest with just always having grind grinding cutting wrenching on cleaning carbs on the dirt bikes or doing stuff like that so that kind of fell into um, a welding job that I picked up um, after taking El Cajon ROP welding classes. I wanted to hone in some skills, so I went there and learned how to weld. And uh, then from there, I went to um, Babcom, where they actually bent like PRP seat frames and stuff and welded stuff like that together and everything. And I did that for a little bit. And then uh, just after, before I was eight, that was before I was 18, after hours. And then I went to PRD, Precision Race Development, and asked for a job. And he told me that I had to be 18 so he could 1099 me. And I had to go to the city and get my own business license. So I did that and I named it Wilkie Works. And uh, from the time I was 18 till I was like almost 20, I just was a sponge, man. I mean, started sweeping the floors, learning how to bend cut, grind, do whatever it took. I was just basically um, hands-on with Chris Farmer, who's still a really good friend of mine, and learned a lot, a lot from. And uh, that's where I started building the um, uh, the Shark, the OG Shark. Um, from there, I uh, went to Short Course for almost three years, uh, moved up to, to Canyon Lake and worked in Corona on a Short Course off-road racing team for three years. So in short course, you break a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff wears out. You find where failure points are. You find uh, how to build stuff, rebuild stuff quickly and efficiently and manage time. And I was uh, a crew chief for a couple different vehicles throughout those three years with uh, PMG Hart Huntington. You know, got to work with alongside with Carrie Hart, uh, Twitch at one point, Josh Merrill, um, and, you know, see a bunch of other heroes of mine like Rob Mack and Carl Renazener and just legends of the sports on, on the regular. And then after that, kind of, you know, I was, I was definitely hungry for, for race wins and stuff. And, you know, money kind of came into a play where I was like just working crazy and I didn't have the money to finish my car or build my car to how I wanted it to be. And, um, they, we weren't able to kind of prep cars up to my standards. And I just had a lot of weight on my shoulders for knowing that we didn't have cars that were hundred percent. I uh, had to step away and, uh, cause I had also a really good opportunity in construction. So I went and did construction for several years and made good money welding and construction. And that's kind of what allowed me to finish the bug and uh, have kind of a normal schedule to where I could get off work every day at two thirty, and then kind of follow other passions that were that were my passions. But uh, learned a lot, and that's kind of what gave me a head start and the the capital to to do so and build all these crazy elaborate vehicles. I know that uh, a lot of us 
in the back of our head would say, you know, if I had the tools, I would just do that myself instead of buying it or, or whatever the case may be. Um, and, and there's definitely a place for the, for the companies to buy those products because a lot of us can't or don't have the space or the tools. Uh, but for someone like me, I've always had a longing to learn how to weld and how to fabricate my own stuff and how to do my own cages and how to do repairs and things like that. Uh, for somebody that has the ability to maybe take the time or the investment, where do you recommend starting getting into the fab process and learning? Because a lot of us are working jobs. We can't just go join you know, a fab shop and start learning from the masters, things like that. Where would you kind of give us a perspective of if you want to learn how to fab your own stuff, where should you start? I mean, honestly, YouTube, again, is a powerful tool. There's so much information on there. So, I mean, I would do your, your research on there. And I mean, I mean, I built, uh, I built so many different things with very little tools, such as a chop saw, an angle grinder and a welder. You know, um, two benders, JD squared, two bender, kind of the, the manual one. Those are super cheap and effective, but, um, there's, there's, you can find so much information through the, through the internet. I would say your most powerful tool is the, is the internet, a little bit of free time and, and focusing on, uh, on that stuff. But, um, again, then it's, then it becomes, you know, just diving in and, and buying, purchasing some of these tools and, and figuring it out. The nice thing about these tools is um, they might be a little pricey depending on what models you get. But uh, um, at the same time, if, it, if it's not for you and you don't dive in, you'll never know. There's a there's a hot debate on the YouTube. Uh, like I said, I've been kind of fascinated with this whole idea of getting into fabrication myself. Uh, there's a whole debate on whether you should start with stick or if you should start with MIG. Uh, where would you maybe where, where where would your perspective maybe come in on that? MIG welding, MIG welder all day because um, a stick, it's not the cleanest. It's more for like, I would say structural stuff um, versus like clean off-road stuff. So um, yeah, dude, MIG welder all day. If anyone's trying to get into like fabrication and off-road um, and has a stick welder, sell it by a MIG welder. And then the follow-up discussion that usually ends up at the end of those uh, those threads is uh, TIG versus MIG for your for your roll cage and and all that stuff. Um, would you say that you know looking looking at that process that it really doesn't make a huge difference, or is there a noticeable difference in your opinion of like should you invest the time of buying the TIG and going to learn TIG, or should you say MIG is good enough for structural? I'm going to be okay and I'm going to be safe and and I know I'm going to do a good job. Yeah. And it kind of deal it, that goes with also with like settings, you know, I mean, there's been uh, TIG welds that look beautiful that might not have the penetration they need. Um, similar fashion with, with MIG welds. Um, MIG is definitely a lot faster, um, but TIG, it, a TIG machine, you can do a lot more, has more capabilities with, you know, steel, aluminum and, and various types of metals. Um, you can do aluminum and stainless and all that stuff with, with, uh, with a MIG welder as well. Um, MIG welders also put out a little bit of spatter, which, you know, can, uh, yeah, can, can obviously make stuff not look as pretty if you don't prep it and, or get rid of it. Um, TIG, you know, obviously you have your pedal, you have your rod and you have your torch. So you have three things going on versus a MIG. You just have a trigger. Um, TIG is much harder to pick up. It's going to take you a lot longer and a lot more patience. That's for sure. Um, I mean, I can do it. It depends on the project on what I'm going to MIG and TIG. Um, so for an entry per an entry level person, a MIG welder all day, because you can learn the fundamentals of the flow of the puddle and just kind of, uh, pick it up quicker and actually get stuff done and probably get less frustrated in the meantime, to deter you away from fabrication. Yeah, I don't think there's any loss of investment when you buy a MIG either. Like if you if you feel like you need to go to TIG, you're still going to want that MIG around. Oh, yeah. Um, we got both and uh, I use them both equally on on different projects all the time. So having both is, is the best of both worlds. But if you're entry and you're going to be doing a lot of steel work, I would say like roll cages, bumpers, trailer repair, all stuff like that, then... Uh, a MIG welder is probably your best bet. But if you're, if you get to the point where you're like, you know, you're, you're a badass and you want to spend the time and make everything epic and you got plenty of time to do so, then, uh, you know, TIG's, TIG's the elite, I guess the elite machine and the elite 
uh, elite. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you're going to go pro, you, you need to look for that. But if that's not going to be your living, if it's just going to be a hobby or if it's just going to be fixing things on the weekend. Um, I think that, uh, from what I've seen and what you're saying that the MIG machine's going to treat you good and treat you well. Ian, cool. what's up? When, when's the last time you welded? Uh, I used to, uh, I used to make and repair, um, aluminum tanks in the fertilizer game. So like when I was 19 years old, I took this job at this fertilizer co-op and exposed myself to nauseous chemicals up until the point I was about 22, 23. Is that and what's wrong like with those you? Fertilizer. <laughs> and all right. Uh, but like those fertilizer implements and stuff like that, that you see being pulled behind those massive tractors. I used to actually make those in the winter oh. and, uh, that that's kind of, you know, it's a lot different than a roll cage and stuff. And, you know, some people that would judge my welds would say, I don't need a welder. I need a grinder, but whatever, you know, it, uh, <laughs> it's a process. It's learn, you know, you got to learn. <laughs> you guys probably used like a, a MIG spool gun. We used a Millermatic. Yep. That's exactly what we use. Yeah. Uh, more production stuff for sure. That's what for I, real. that's what yeah. I used on the inside of my, my, my death boat was I MIG the whole inside because there's over 140 feet of welding. And I know those chemicals you're talking about because when I was under there, when I didn't have my mask on or when I first started it, um, I had to make sure I put my mask on after that because I got up a couple of times lightheaded and was like, this is heavy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like most teenagers back then, I was much, much better with an acetylene torch than I was a welder. <laughs> so I want to jump into urban assault just real quick, but going into the life of Blake Wilkie, right? Like how what was life like before urban assault dude i was just uh, a kid growing up in east county san diego um uh, my parents tried or my grandparents actually tried to get me into like bowling and golf and a few other things that my grandpa was into that my my grandpa could could partake with me and it was like that was his stuff and then uh my mom and dad got me a dirt bike when i was seven and i said they tri- and then rode that till I was like nine and then they tried to get me back into team sports. I'm like, this shit sucks. <laughs> it's but, hard to go back. Like where's, where's my dirt bike at, man? Like, like I want to go ride with my friends and stuff. And, um, then it was kind of just after getting that, that first XR 70 when I was seven, it was motorsports driven, you know, but before that I grew up going to, uh, to buttercup and glamis with, with my mom and, uh, and the river and stuff. So, but I was around like hot rod jet boats and, and buggies that uh, some of her friends always built themselves and took pride on and were always wrenching on stuff. So it was always kind of at a young age, I was, I was encompassed around it. And then uh, once I got that freedom of a dirt bike, it was, it was always, always something to do with the desert. I heard a rumor about you way back in the day that you were uh, uh, basically around around that glamour scene so much that you would tell people, you're just like, you guys just watch. One of these days, I'm going to build the biggest, baddest bug you guys have ever seen. Is that legit or is that just all legend? <laughs> um, pretty legit. I mean, I started out with like a, a Chenoweth that I chopped the whole front end off and got uh, that was from a dude that was, he wrecked the inner pivot. So I built arms and a bunch of different stuff. So it was a stepping stone up to, to that bug for sure. It was kind of a couple of different projects prior to the bug that I saw were cost effective, but something that I could also profit off of when I was 16 years old. So like, yeah, so like for the first two years, but the focus was always to build a bug. I just never found the right platform or like originally. So up until, um, up until I started it when I was almost 18, there was a couple other projects to kind of try to get the money right to, to work up to that big, bad bug. So what is the inspiration for the bug? I know you're Southern California and there's a large bug scene down there, but where did it really take hold on you to uh, really kind of intertwine your life with these uh, bug uh, bodies? So it was, you know, it was looking back at a picture, excuse me, that my mom had when I was first born, when she had a bug and I was a baby and a bug and my mom just looked super happy. And I was a little baby stoked. And a couple of months after I was born, my, my grandmother actually saw a bug that had been crashed and the thing opened up like a tuna can. She said, because there's not a whole lot of structure. It's a lightweight vehicle against, you know, some big heavy trucks back in the day, especially. 
And she said, you know, we're going to get you a minivan or something that's more safe for you and our grandchild. So um, even though it was short lived, it was just something that kind of stuck and the SoCal vibe and just something that was small, compact. I wanted it to be wide. I wanted it to look like a spider monkey. I wanted it to have a lot of travel and be something that was different that you didn't normally see out there and uh, kind of fit that 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 chill San Diego cruising vibe. So uh, in your background behind you, you've got a number of uh, pretty sweet uh, shredder boards back there. So uh, I'm assuming that the waves have played a, a large part in also the bug scene as well, but also your life. Uh, is that something that you've pursued pretty aggressively? No, just because, I mean, I do enjoy, you know, riding different boards. It's, it's like, it's a very, you know, surfboards are cheap compared to off-road parts, but I mean, <laughs> I've collected over the years and they all have kind of their, their own, you know, uh, their own ride, I guess you can say to each board. So I try to get wet as much as possible. Off-roads definitely with the wave of momentum I have going in off-road. I haven't caught enough waves with, uh, with surfing plus my shoulders not necessarily the best after some dirt bike injuries. So I need to get back out there though and get salty. I thoroughly enjoyed your pun. I, I, I really did. Um, the, uh, so the dirt bike scene, uh, you know, what, how, how did that go? Is that anything that expanded into anything or was that just simply you, uh, and dirt bikes on the weekend? Did you actually go racing? Were you uh, competitive at all? Oh yeah. We went to like, uh, the Vegas world minis. I never did the minios, but we did like California gold state gold cup series. We did a lot of the, the, the local stuff. Um, I always raced a stock bike in both the stock and mod class. So because we could only afford one bike, you know, some of these yep. kids had like three bikes and stuff. So I'd have a stock bike that I'd race against, you know, all the, all the big dogs. Um, in schoolboy class, the gold cup, where there's like 120 kids in that, in that, uh, in that class back in the day, I got second in that class. And then the novice class, which was super fast. Um, I would have gotten top three for sure, but I blew my bike up at Glen Helen after the Talladega start coming down the hill. I, I went from like, I think fourth or fifth gear and downshifted twice accidentally floated a valve. So that kind of messed up that whole scene. But, um, it was yeah something I was super passionate about and I was my dad called me a maniac because I just wanted to go faster and faster and <laughs> wasn't necessarily reckless but I'd, I'd crash and and burn and pay the price a lot but I was never really scared of the bike and like even today like I still get on a bike and I could still rip um it's a lot something that a lot of people did, don't really know but I'll surprise you when I throw a leg over a bike. I'll get nasty and throw it <laughs> sideways. I've seen you guys get pretty rowdy in the in the back shop with, with the the pit bikes. Oh yeah, that was uh, that was a good time. But we just went out to Beaumont after the last rain and uh, found some super sketchy hits out there, third, fourth gear stuff that you know most people wouldn't even bat an eye at. And uh, um, I was keeping up with all the boys that that still avidly do it after a year and a half from. Uh, an AC separation on my, my right shoulder. And, uh, yeah, it's fun, dude. It's something that's just like, you have ultimate freedom with for sure. You got a little background in skateboarding too, if I recall, right. Just cruising that now. But cruising? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I used to, I used to do like handrails and stuff. It's hard not to, uh, it's hard not to kind of fall into a little bit of everything, you know, around here, especially when you're growing up in high school and there's, so many good skate spots and you got a bunch of friends that skate or, or BMX that's BMX bikes. They, they really did hurt me too, but <laughs> Dude, um, that's, that's yeah. what I grew up on, man. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, yeah, if I go look and I might still be able to, I got an old Greg Hill pro out here somewhere. I looked up what that thing was worth. I might have to sell that one of these days. <laughs> yeah. You, it's interesting. You say keeping up with the boys on the Hills with the dirt bikes. Um, now that you're at a, at such a, I don't want to say such a celebrity status, but at a, at a status to where you're kind of more mindful of how you operate and treat your body and things like that. Um, kind of what goes through your head when you're doing stuff like that? Is it still uh, the freedom of just getting out there and shredding or is it a little bit more uh, calculated nowadays with um, maybe thinking about how is this going to impact me this weekend? I got something to do, things like that. Yeah. You know, with, with especially this, uh, the whole quarantine right now and stuff, I mean, there's a lot more, I have a lot more freedom to kind of maybe button some things up and take a little bit of time for, 
for me time for my lady. Like we just went to the river, but like when we went out there and we rode, it was kind of the early stages of the quarantine. So, um, it was nice to just like, you know, everything's canceled. Like the, we got the hills, they're wet, you know, let's assemble a crew. It's not like we're going to be, we're going to have helmets on. We're going to be obviously more than six feet apart. So we got like 10, 15 dudes together and there's actually YouTube edit, you know, of us riding out in the hills, doing some sketchy hill climbs and um, hitting all these big jumps that were just, you know, super fun. But it's something that I definitely think about, um, think about usually before and after, but not at the time. It's like that <laughs> jump looks like so much fun and it's third gear pinned. All right. He just hit it. You kind of get a, a little judge for it, especially since that's their backyard. Some of my boys out there, Mowgli to be exact, but uh, it's like you, you see someone else do it and you kind of can judge how the speed, the body English, the pop off the lip. And then, you know, you just go for it if you're comfortable, but I definitely, there was, there was one or two that, you know, a few of the boys weren't comfortable with and a couple of the, the dudes that have a little bit higher skill level hit. And, you know, I, I said, no, I don't, I don't need to, I don't need to keep up all the time, but when I'm comfortable, I'll, uh, I'll go for it. One of the things that uh, people often say during an accident is they ran out of talent, right? But one of the talents yep. that you can generate is the ability to observe and judge, uh, you know, just like you were saying, and making sure that you're capable of doing um, whatever that stunt is and, and whatnot. So definitely something that uh, isn't shied down on, uh, um, in my opinion, I think that people definitely need to learn that skill of observing and making sure that they're making educated choices out there on the trail sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm still starting. I'm still getting a little bit of a feel on four wheels, man. It's like, I'll look at some jumps and I'm like, I'm not going to hit that unless I got a dirt bike, you know? And that's, that's like so weird because most people would be sketched out by hitting certain stuff on a dirt bike. Let's get into urban assault just a little bit. I don't want to spend too much time on it. You've said this uh, story probably a million times plus one. And, uh, but uh, it, it, it deserves a little bit of a spot just because that kind of threw you into the limelight, right? That kind of exploded and went viral for you um, at a time when YouTube was really starting to take off. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't really quite the powerhouse that it is today. Uh, it was huge back then, but it wasn't quite what is synonymous with watching videos as it is today, right? So Urban Assault came out early, I want to say January 2016. Is that about right? Sure. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so uh just a quick synopsis of what this video is um you had built uh this bug that you had talked about um and is uh, enshrined on your uh, right bicep <laughs> that's awesome uh the i believe you called it the shark attack correct and uh this was a me like a mega buggy that you had built and went and shredded up the uh streets of southern san diego something like that yeah yeah so um, what was, uh, I mean, this video has millions of views now and it's all over the web and it's been integrated into numerous other different YouTube channels and commentary and things like that. Uh, kind of gives us a mindset going into that. What was like, because you had just come out of, like, how long has this car been built at this time? Like, was it fresh? Was it like you had used it for a year or two? Like, where was this all at? Um, I'll give you, yeah, a quick, short and sweet, uh, basically started the car when I was 17 and went through three different motors, transmissions, um, phases of it. Uh, when I was right before I was eight, actually 18, spent like two thirds of every paycheck. Cause I wasn't, I wasn't really, didn't have a lot of bills, but I was working, uh, summers and after school and whatnot, and then going to college part or full time and working still full time. So um, basically built this thing up until I was 26 years old and got it to the point where it had that big, nasty, uh, supercharged LS ripped it around for like a, a desert season and then had some, some interest in some guys overseas buying it. I knew how much I had invested into it. I knew what I could have done better. I knew, um, that I could have, you know, put bigger, better components on it, like the transmission, but it still was pretty solid. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to build something that I could potentially race. And I just had a whole bunch of different, like, kind of like emotions. And it was kind of the, the money aspect, you know, the car without the bug body on it was probably worth, you know, a third or half of that, you know, but the bug body really kind of made it that special, unique vehicle. So, um, once I got kind of that dollar figure dangled in front of my face, I was like, 
let's start over because it's like, how am I going to improve upon this without spending a lot more money on like transaxle rear hubs? Like, you know, so I was like, all right, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to sell this thing, but I want to do what I've always kind of grown up doing on like skateboards and like BMX. And, you know, that's thrash some of these, some of these things that you see on the sides of the highways and like locally growing up, maybe a couple of the jumps that we've always kind of terrorized growing up in high school when we first got our license and stuff. But like, let's film it like a casual Sunday scroll, you know, before we ship this thing overseas and kind of give it like our last fun hurrah and uh, thrasher skater, just punk rock style. And uh, we did it and we had no expectations of it going viral, no expectations of like the law coming after us. And, uh, <laughs> and that was because unless we got caught and we didn't get caught, so ship the car overseas uh dude paid fourteen thousand dollars to fly it overseas he was playing with it that by the weekend when i shipped it over there on like a monday and uh luckily Corey from perplex media he didn't finish the edit for uh, like three four weeks after the car was shipped so um once the car was shipped overseas the dude from emirat shipping in santa Ana called me and said yo what's up with this? Uh, what's up with this? Why are like law enforcement here looking for this car? <laughs> and uh, I was like, well, where's the car? He said, I was like, it's overseas, right? He's, he's like, yeah, they're trying to like seize the car. And I was like, well, tell them to go fetch. And then like, <laughs> that's when like the news and everything started just blowing up. And I was like, this doesn't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> and and so uh, you just so everyone's kind of aware how this how this went down. You you and your buddies just went out and literally drove around, dropped camera, took the shot, jumped back on, went somewhere else, dropped camera, took the shot, and then you were in and out of uh, the urban area fairly quickly, right? I mean, was you weren't doing a full photo shoot or anything like that. It wasn't like. Uh, you guys had this production going on. This was like raw, like OG skater film vibe where you guys just went out, got the shot and took off, right? Yeah. And we, we had like two vehicles. We had another vehicle that kind of like searched the area, scanned the area. If it was like anything that was in an area where there could have been some potential danger, you know, that was just keeping the thinking cap on, you know, even though we are doing what people would call reckless where we're definitely doing, we did a little bit of homework um, at the time to, to make sure that it wasn't, it wasn't going to put other people at risk as much as certain people would assume. So, right. And so this all went down and at this time people weren't really doing the whole um, stunting and video production stuff that you would normally see today with a higher, higher end media company. Um, And so YouTube kind of changed the perspective that you had because all of a sudden you start getting a lot of attention. You start getting a lot of people asking questions. Then the law enforcement starts coming in and you can't really step back and say, no, that didn't happen because now it's all over the web. Uh, the evidence is there, right? So, um, you know, how does how does this, like the perspective you had going into this and then the perspective, you know, the number of days later after this has gone big and you start getting phone calls, like where, where was your mindset? Like were you like totally just flabbergasted or were you just actually like okay this is cool this is rad we're gonna avoid this and make it even better it was a roller coaster of emotions honestly i remember being uh, working at a job site downtown um because i was working doing hvac construction at that time we were working at a job site downtown you know my mom calls me is like hey the news there's two news vans here like what's up with it and uh i just told her you know what'd you say to him she's like oh he's at work i was like you should have just probably told him that i didn't live there but uh (laughs) like the news reporters poached me and then like they're asking me questions and i'm just like no 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 like you know so i i I called one of my friends who's a a lawyer and asked him like what i should do and he's like just stay chill stay quiet and see what happens so you know i would i would be at that job site downtown i'd be skating i'd skate to and from the job site because we had to park far away and I was just like thinking, seeing like maybe police vehicles like outside the job site on lunch. I'm like, are they going to come and like detain me? Like, because, you know, I've never been in in trouble. So like, it was kind of like, this is cool because I'm getting a lot of notoriety and people like really enjoyed the build. And a lot of people enjoyed the video because I know that, you know, we all get a little sideways here and there on the street, but I just decided to film it. 
so it was a roller coaster leading up until like when I told him like, Hey, if I need representation, let me know. So he poked his head in there in the DA's office and found out who the prosecutor was and said, the mayor of San Diego is bringing some heat. Yeah. And then that's when, that's when shit got real. <laughs> <laughs> when the boss man says you've been naughty, that's a, that's a scary stick to be looking at. Yeah. So uh, what was it like? Like, how did they go down where these guys in, uh, overseas were looking at buying that car? Like, was that just a phone call one day? Was that like, how, how did that happen? I mean, I listed the car because before the, before the video and everything, the car had a lot of attention. We were out at Glamis doing wheelies down the sand drags. We were making fun edits with uh, the Dirt Alliance boys at the time, now, which now is Terror Crew. Um, and we were just having fun and we were going big, you know, all of us sessioning together in the desert and showcasing the car's capabilities. And their scene out there is all about wheeling, but, you know, they don't really have a whole lot of cars that they jump. And this was kind of like a, a, a do all car. And, um, and it had, it's had started getting a lot of momentum even before the video. So, um, so you were yeah, already thinking kind of, about moving on, uh, well before the video and before this guy even offered, offered to buy it from you, you, you had the idea that, uh, the future, uh, build looks different and we're going to invest in it and get this car sold. Yeah. If the price is right, you know, yeah. uh, that's what it, that's, it's, it's all about stepping stones. And this was a stepping stone, even though I regretted it and kicked myself in the pants and, uh, it's still a part, but couldn't have sold it to anyone more special than Muhammad over there because, I'm sure you guys have seen us go over there and play with it in the past. So <clears throat> let's do a really quick breakdown on, on some of these more popular cars you've built over the, over the years, right? So you started off with Shark Attack, you went to Megalodon, and there's a couple other ones that followed that, but kind of spec out what Shark Attack ended up being, and then where Megalodon came about and how that transformed and, and kind of maybe contrast the two, what makes them different, because they're both ultimate buggy b builds right um what 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 does the legacy of the shark attack have in the megalodon and how do they contrast so i mean obviously the the first car i i built with uh prd i literally towed that thing on a trailer to the shop because we didn't have room and built a lot of it on a trailer on jack stands from my dad's house off uh that was like five miles away from the shop um you know, I had a couple of different upgrading phases, just like a lot of cars can have, you know, as you progress. Um, both center mounted A arms, both independent uh, IRS setups in the rear. Uh, both have LS based engines. It, the Shark Attack had, or the Shark had a 2D transmission. Um, Megalodon now has the Mendiola S5D, which is the top of the line Mendiola. Um, they both had 934s. Um, the one thing that, that kind of, set the shark back from megalodon was the fact that the rear shocks were inside the cab with so much leverage on the rear arms you know tuning um tuning something of that nature is a little bit harder to do with so much leverage on there to get both whoops and big sends like big hucks um all dialed in so that was something that always kind of like bummed me out i guess you could say for how big i wanted to go um, again, rear engine cars are a handful to drive with, you know, throttle control, um, you know, bottoming out, bucking. You see a lot of buggies go end over end. And um, it was just kind of something that scared me to to, to push to the limits and, and then some. Um, the, the Megalodon, I mean, they're both so comparable in so many ways besides that rear shock package. Um yeah. So, what, man, so what's different? Because you're a big King Shocks guy. Um, I believe the first one had Kings on it, right? Uh, it actually had Foxes, and oh, okay. I bought them used. I bought them used, and it was just the deal that I came across and um, had to set up. But yeah, I, I mean, they're both badass companies. Um, so what, know, what makes King, the Megalodon different in the rear end when it comes to suspension? Is it just the fact that it's a better shock, or is it you had different geometry, different length? What what kind of plays into making that more of a manageable beast? Uh, it's, it has a shorter arm with the shocks further back on it to where there's way less leverage on the shocks to where you have a lot more fine-tuning capabilities, which is, which is huge. And then also... Uh, this added a lot of structure to where, you know, um, I find I found cracks in the other car and had to like cut and kind of do some stuff. But this car actually started out, this car went through, Megalodon went through a ton of phases too. Like 
I bought it from Molinex, James Molinex, who actually built the engine in the car. Um, super rad dude. He it started out as a Penhall Class Five that had a beam front end. The whole front end was cut off, center mounted. Uh, then a big LS was stuffed in it. Mendiola transmission, bigger rear arm. So like this one went through a phase two before I even got it. And then when I got it, I put the bug body back on it um, because he had a Penhall Class uh, Ten body on it. And a whole bunch of different stuff. So I found this after I sold the shark for a killer deal and then just morphed it into what I saw it could be. But the wheelbase was right. The width and everything was was right. It was a solid platform with a lot of the top-notch parts. He spent a lot of money on the car. And then from there, I just made it my own and then added some structure and uh, was ready to go put the thing to the test. And I'm sure you guys have seen that. The, uh, the, the first build was a little wider, wasn't it? Uh, by two inches. Oh, okay. It's weird. Cause the camera makes it look substantially wider. <laughs> the cab. Uh, yeah. The cab's narrower, camera. right? Yeah. 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 So, uh, the Megalodon is currently your main buggy, right? Yep. She's the, she's the queen bee right now. And, uh, she's a couple years old, two, three years old now. Uh, two and a half. I want to say, yeah. So, is there a point in, um, like everyone has a car, eventually they get, there's a, a <coughs> period of excitement having a new car and, and they, they trick it out and they do all the upgrades. And then eventually there's this itch in the back of their head saying, I want to do something different. Uh, for you, it seems like you just add another vehicle to the stable versus getting rid of that car and, add, and, and redoing it again, because now you've added also a slug shark and a death boat. So kind of give me the rundown on where this, these itches for, um, the death boat, which is out of nowhere, in my opinion, because I know you're a boat guy, you've been on the river a lot, things like that. But, uh, the death boat is quite literally a death trap for some people if they didn't know how to handle a thing. And then also the slug shark is such a unique vehicle in, in its own right. Uh, a little bit more purpose built, I think, uh, if you were to talk to that. But um, kind of give me the, um, the rundown on where the itch came for these two builds and, and what they are. So this year, um, you know, coming into this year, I wanted to build, I wanted to build a, like a race capable vehicle. And I've showed Ian and some people have seen some pictures floating around on, on social media and whatnot of what I'm going to call the Mako shark, which is the front engine, uh, trophy truck bug shark kind of platform. And, uh, yeah, so that is still, that's going to take a lot of funding to, to get, to come to life. So, and, and where are you looking Kevin, to race that one at? Uh, yeah, just like select races though. Not, okay. not like a full season because that stuff takes so much money and so much dedication and upkeep. I'd rather go thrash with the friends and put this thing in the public eye you know, but, um, circling, but Kevin's still finishing up that, uh, that entire chassis and everything on SolidWorks. We're doing that in house. So we want to document that build, but we want to do it right. And, uh, there's some tweaks and just, it's, it's such a process, you know? Um, but circling back to the class 11, I knew that we weren't going to have that started till about mid year. And I got this itch, you know, Hey, I've always wanted to race the mint. I talked to the Martelli brothers, Matt more so. And was like, hey, you guys see that video at Rage at the River, the land rush start of all the bugs? Like, all right, here's my, I want to go to like the basic level to where people in the industry or in the sport, maybe we can get people together to come and race the most budgeted form of racing and show people that you don't have to have hundreds of thousands of dollars to go racing. You can build something on a budget for, you know, depending on how wild you want to go, something like my car is probably like 18 grand. 20 grand, but there's people that have these cars that are like five, six grand, you know, and, and show people that, Hey, you come race with us, have a good time, show how much fun it is. It's safe. It's something you can build with your kid in the garage and, uh, just show people like, like build this, build the bug on a little YouTube series, which we have and try to educate people and have fun with it and then go race the mitt. And we had, like under six weeks to do it. So we just dove into it and uh, ended up coming out with a second place finish. And it was rough and tough and super <laughs> fun. <laughs> it definitely looked a little bit rough. Your back must have had a few adjustments after that race because it, it bucked you around pretty good, I think. It did, but the speeds that it happens at are much slower than like a TT or a class one. And I mean, 
Um, when you're talking, you know, hundred miles an hour versus like section that in sections that we're doing like 15 miles an in because of the just, you know, different realms, it's, uh, it's comparable still. I feel like a lot of people think that they're so much rougher than what they are, but they're actually surprisingly, surprisingly smooth. So, um, give me a little background on the, uh, on the death boat. I, I was actually personally very interested on the build as you documented that online, uh, just how, how much thought and, and idea creativity went into this thing. And then just the sheer amount of capability on the water. Once you're out shredding it, just up and down the river on the thing. Um, it seems like it's just a mind blowing experience to, to have that kind of off roadness on the water. Uh, kind of give us the background on that and, and why it came about and, and what you're doing with it. So I saw the guys, um, up in, uh, Canada actually with jet stream adventure boats and a few other manufacturers. And, uh, I just saw what they were doing with them. And that's like a side by side for the water. I've had, you know, hot rod jet boats with, big blocks in them. I've had, uh, I had a boat the, my last boat prior to this build was uh, a 21 foot Avenger with a big two stroke on it. And they were fun, but you know, all you can do is go up and down river hauling butt, you know, or like tow a skier or wakeboarder, but you know, the hot rod boats aren't kind of really meant for that. So I was like, what can I do that can encompass like everything? And after seeing those ones, I was like, or those, the jet stream adventure boats, I was like, it's like going to be like three times as expensive as these other boats, but it's going to be super unique. And uh, let's build a long travel trailer for it. Let's tow it behind the bug. Let's let's generate some cool content for it. Let's jump some shit. Let's have some fun. And um, I bought the hole, um, told the guy kind of what I wanted to do with it. And I'm sure he's heard a bunch of stories. And um, he gave me a few hundred bucks off on like shipping and whatnot. So I was like, um, I was like, you know, I don't go into things asking people. I want to make sure that I prove my worth. And I had no relationship with him prior, but, um, after it's done, he's like, dude, that's the coolest boat out there. So I, I built a roll cage for it, a roof, put all the rigid lights on it, PRV seats and did everything that has kind of off-road influence, um, on this boat and, uh, put a big skid plate on it and decided to go jump some stuff. <laughs> and when you say jump some stuff in a boat, that doesn't necessarily connect with people uh, all the time. Uh, we're talking about sandbars, little jetties, things like that that shoot out in the, on the on the water. You're hitting rocks at full speed and getting air. Uh, what's the what's the biggest? Um, oh my god, I can't believe I just did that moment with that boat. Um, there was this little landmass. I mean, there's been so many. It's like, dude, towing the thing behind you know, Megalodon at 60 miles an hour through whoops is like, <laughs> I, sh I shouldn't be doing this. But, um, there was one feature where, um, in Havasu assault, where you can see this on YouTube, uh, that heat wave, um, uh, helped me edit. I come up over this, this land mass and it's like three feet out of the water and I hit it like 30 and it feels like I'm in a car <laughs> crash. It's like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, because it's, there's no suspension to give it's, it's straight one-on-one -on -one and uh, you're trying to go up over something that doesn't really move. And it was, it was loud. And I was like, I hope I just didn't like put a huge dent in this thing or hurt it and came over the backside, scooped up like 55 gallons of water. <laughs> and uh, the thing was sitting alone. It's all bogging out. And I'm just like, that probably wasn't smart. <laughs> but it didn't hurt it and i was like yeah. first outing like being okay that was your first time out yeah so for have to assault it was the first time out no test time finished it went straight out there towed it behind the bug and uh dropped it in the water and only had one issue the whole weekend and uh learned a lot brought it back to the shop made some adjustments and uh have done that a couple of times since and she's pretty she's pretty dialed now hey, what's the overall length on that boat 10 feet 10 feet so and, and and what kind of motor is in it again so the motor package in it i bought a whole so what what a lot of these guys do is they take a sea -Doo or like a, a jet ski and they pull the motor out of it the electronics they pull um every the pump everything out of one of those and stuff them in these holes and then uh but it's a it came out of a sea -Doo 215 wake pro um, I ended up putting a 260, 260 supercharger and injector kit on it. And then 
Uh, I had race lab tune the ECU and it probably puts down about 270, 275 horsepower. On a 10 foot boat, <laughs> which is, which is nuts. Now I personally thought that the trailer setup you had on this thing was just crazy. Uh, you have King shocks that match the buggy. You have a full custom uh, trailer to match the boat because the boat doesn't exist outside of what you built. Right. And, uh, and then the whole hitch setup is, is pretty crazy to allow you to do a lot of interesting things. Um, and, uh, kind of explain the process going into that. Was that just like, I'm going to slap this different hitch on there and, and see what happens or like, what was the process on de designing a boat trailer to go Baha'ing in? Um, you know, I can't take a hundred percent credit for this one because it was my idea. And, you know, just like what we do with all of our buddies, we bounce ideas off each other. Yep. So Ke Kevin with Quixotic, who's under the same house, you know, I told him, Hey, I want to build this long travel trailer. Like, obviously we've seen like the videos where you have like a fifth, there's a fifth wheel hitch over that Volkswagen bug that does like three sixties and turns around with the trailer. I'm all, it has to be something up high. So it has to be something rigid. Um, and he's like uniball and he's really good with SolidWorks. He's the one doing the, uh, he's the one doing the, the Mako shark, the TT bug. He's, he's like, let me build something on the, uh, computer. I'm like, I wanted to have independent suspension in the rear trailing arms. I want to put coilover bypass on it just because, um, and, uh, have it kind of like the shock position, have it be look like it's like a actual buggy in a trailing arm position to where everything's kind of proportionate, but, you know, keep, keep in mind that we want a little bit of tongue weight, but not too much because if it's on the back of the bug. All we're going to do is wheelie and not be able to steer. So, um, we put our heads together and, uh, kind of started drawing stuff on paper, mapping out, you know, distances and, and jotting everything down. And he put the trailer in SolidWorks and I was so busy. I'm like, let me pay you to build this trailer. You know, you just put it in SolidWorks. You're, he's really good at what he does. And, and, uh, together we built the trailer, but he, he did, I would say 90, 90% of the work on that. I just did a lot of the finished stuff and hats off to him. Cause he's a bad dude. When you look at some of the comments and stuff on, on some of your threads that you post up, I've never seen a trailer ever get more comments and more questions. <laughs> Have you noticed that as well? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's because it's unique and it's just sometimes it a little is. outside of the box, and uh, that's kind of what we do good. It's like it's it's about building smiles and and then building something that we thrash, and then that we always put in the public eye, whether it's at Sand Sports Super Show, Havasu for Desert Storm. I think that's where my value with with partners come into play. Is it's it doesn't have to be the most expensive or the most elaborate or this has to be something that's different that people can see and, and, and watch the content we do and put a smile on their face and then want to take a picture next to it and, or potentially get a ride in it if they catch me at the right time and place. <laughs> so, uh, I want to get into, uh, your forays into the razor, uh, in a second, but, uh, first I want to play a little game with you. Uh, I call this shred better dead. This is my little take on the, uh, kiss married kill uh game so if you had to uh, shred one vehicle only once and then get rid of it two take one to bed and keep it for the rest of your life and three uh have to put it down which uh which one would you do between megalodon slug shark and death boat well i mean the slug shark is the the slowest so and the least expensive so that'd probably be the one that would be dead first <laughs> <laughs> or no, not be dead first, but that's probably the one that I would put to bed. Yep. Um, I mean, Megalodon's just a handful and you can do so much with it. And I would probably say that's the one that I'm going to shred because it has the horsepower and it puts you, puts you back in the seat. And then uh, dead would probably be, the death boat would probably be the, be the one that would die the first <laughs> because we're doing things that you shouldn't be doing and or sinking it or, or whatnot, but. That's probably my other some Megalodon shred, dead death boat, bed, class eleven. Nice. Uh and then uh Qatar. So we we've talked a little bit about overseas guys looking to buy your your machines. Um that is such a different world over there. And we get small little like insights to how that place operates when we watch YouTube videos and things like that. Um 
kind of give me your perspective on it. Like you've come from an American side where you're building American muscle and you're building these cars that can do crazy things on American soil. But these guys over there are, are just dumping tons of money into these machines and the experience that actually goes into all that and just the different culture things. And um, I think you did some stuff with like uh, eagle hunting and stuff like that. Just like what what kind of world and, and mind screw is that going over there and, and uh, experiencing that? Dude, it was absolutely awesome. And it's, it's an eye opener that, you know, they have uh, a very, they, their culture is still very strong. Um, a little backstory on Qatar, what they told me was before they, they hit all these natural resources and got this money, it was country built on, on trade. So when people would come to trade there, they would bring them in and uh, be very hospitable and, you know, shelter them, feed them. And then that way they would go and talk highly about their country and come back and want to trade. You know, now that they have the money, they still have a lot of those values. And that's kind of the way that they treated me. Um, you know, obviously we traded the car for, for money and whatnot. And then they, they wanted me to come out there and experience it. So I said, let me bring Corey, who we did urban assault with. And let's document the, let's document the trip, you know, because it's kind of like we're bridging the gap and that's what we kind of called it was like bridging the gap. And we, we went over there with literally no agenda, no idea what we were going to do, no schedule, just like he booked the plane ticket and we said, let's go and got on a plane, got off there, was greeted by a sign and uh, it was kind of all all history and documented in that uh, Qatar, Shreddy Life Qatar edit. And those guys are very knowledgeable. They knew a lot about the shark and the different, the Motec system, asking different things. Um, so obviously they've been around the block and bought a lot of high end cars, but um, dude, yeah, everything from falcon hunting to riding camels to floating in, in the sea because there's so much salt and you just laying there and then getting. Corey got an ear infection <laughs> and, uh, and then his, his ear bugging him and us going straight to the hospital and their healthcare and everything was just like so different, but so like hospitable. And, and then like their setups out there that they leave out there for six months and their food, how everybody eats together, like kind of, uh, huddled down and everybody eats together, shreds together. It was it was a unique experience on its own. And I'd say that we went back there a second time and I'd say that it's, uh, they're now, they're now people that I can, I can call genuine friends. And, uh, if I needed anything and I had to ask Muhammad, he always is like, everything good. If everyone hurt or whatnot, like we keep in touch, um, pretty regularly. So it's, it's cool. I'm so glad that it went to him and, uh, I've seen it mold and now it's turbocharged and I've seen him make upgrades and, make it his own baby now. So it's, it's, it's definitely, uh, yeah, something you don't see every day, but something I'm really thankful for. Yeah. You, you've had eyes on out there and I always wanted to hit you up about this because at full throttle, we work with some OEs, you know, uh, we work with, uh, uh, sand car manufacturers. And I've had a couple of those owners tell me that just in Dubai, Qatar area, they could survive just on the sales that they do over there. And then when I look at your edit and see just Funko after Funko after Tatum after Extreme Performance, it's just nuts. Is, is, is that kind of been the experience out there? Is there no shortage of Lamborghinis out on the sand? <laughs> um, yeah, man. I mean, if you watch the edit, you'll see you'll see some of these garages where we open up these tents and there's, there's six elite vehicles all made by different manufacturers. So, um, that way they got a little taste and <laughs> they got a little taste of everything. And, uh, yeah, depending on what they're trying to do with it, you know, that that'll be the car that they drive that day. If it's, Hey, let's go, let's go whip it sideways, super hard. And then clutch dump and wheelie. It's, it's usually, you know, a fun co, uh, SU car, um, you know, one of those, one of those top tier manufacturers, but they have certain cars that are set up for a couple of different things. If it's, you know, long cruises and, and whoops and whatnot, then, um, it's cool that they have just such an elite arsenal to pick from. And they've let me drive a handful of them and they're all, they're all right. Cause they all got a lot of horsepower. <laughs> 
What is um, through your experience? I know that the UTV market out there is starting to expand. They're doing the Can Ams quite a bit, and there's a few of the other ones that are starting to make their way out there. Um, w- during your time out there, <coughs> were you seeing UTVs at all alongside these supercars, or was it kind of like two different like segments of the of the industry out there? Oh uh, yeah, it was. Uh, you know, you saw you saw these really high end. You saw either high end cars, Razors, or like your, your Toyotas or your Nissan patrols, which, um, they have different, I guess, times of the day where everyone shreds. So like they'll have like the buggy Hill where everyone's in buggies. They'll have the crazy car Hill. They call it where everybody's doing, trying to cut each other off and zigging and zagging, trying to spray their friends and, or play chicken with each other, which is heavy. (laughs) And, uh, and then they'll have, uh, like the nighttime, they all have razors too. So they have their supercars for the day. And then they have the razors uh, because they say that, you know, the horsepower and the visibility, they don't want to get themselves into trouble. And the razors are just the cruisers and they can put, you know, their kids in them and whatnot and then go cruise and hit sea line and have tea time, which is like every hour. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so there's, it's just cool that they have kind of like a, a, a regiment that they all get to get to shred different vehicles at different times of the day, which is, Sweet. That's the dream. The yeah. uh, So let's talk about the Razor. You uh, recently acquired a Polaris uh, Razor Pro XP, uh, Ultimate Edition, I think, um, yeah. and you've dubbed it the Mini Shark. Uh, how, did, how did this whole thing come about? What's the plans for it? Like, where where is it sitting now? And I just saw a video of you putting the, the Rockford system in it, um, upgrading the audio, but you're, you've got some things going on with that. What's the kind of like game plan? Where did it start and, and where are you taking this thing at? Um, so I got that about a month or about five weeks before new year's. I got it. I thrashed it once, once as it was stock. And the thing was surprising, man. I mean, these things get up and go, um, just of course, you know, being someone that always wants maybe a little bit more or to make something a little custom. Um, I decided to work with a handful of people like HCR, TMW doors, um, and MTS and kind of build one of the first like fully built, but still parts that you can buy aftermarket to where people can duplicate what I've done. I didn't want to go full kill on this and spend a whole bunch of time building like all my own kits and whatnot. I wanted to share the love with some people that have been in the industry for a while and I can fulfill that supply and demand if I did build it for myself or whatnot. But, um, you know, we, I like the way the Magnum cage looked with the spare tire. We put PRP seats with the uh, heated seats in it, switch pro pedal commander, rugged radio system, like did all, everything that your average consumer can do to it. And, uh, then went out and, and thrashed it. And the thing is so much fun. Like we just took it to the river and we go out there and cruise because a lot of friends have side by side. So like, depending it's kind of fallen into the same Qatar aspect. It's like each vehicle serves a purpose for different avenues of where we're going, you know, and, uh, and, or the group that we're going with. So it was something to, to just kind of fill that, that, that void of not of a four wheel drive vehicle that still thrashes and gets busy with it with off the shelf parts to where if Megalodon was down or something, I still had a backup, a backup rig. So the the Razor Pro, uh, have you driven the Razors before the Pro? Very, like usually they're friends, but I wasn't as aggressive as I was with with mine because um, it wasn't mine. But I've driven them a couple times, and uh, they're they're surprising machines, man. I'll tell you what, they're so versatile and very nimble, and the brakes work phenomenal. It's 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 a yeah, it's a little rocket ship. And, uh, I mean, for certain aspects, that thing could definitely kick Megalodon's butt, you know? And then again, Megalodon can, can eat this thing alive too at the same time. So like they both, they both shine in different areas, let's say. 
So coming from a, a background with suspension that is kind of like just dialed to what it is and you're not adjusting things on the fly and going into a super lightweight Razor uh, chassis with dynamic suspension, um, a lot of our, our viewers are interested in the whole concept of going to the, the smart shocks versus the dumb shocks and things like that. Uh, what was your experience on or what's your perspective going from like super high end king shocks to stock shocks and then putting the new king, uh, I think you put did you, no, you left them. You left them stock dynamic shocks, the Fox shocks, right? So, what's your kind of concept of smart shocks versus dumb shocks? Because we're starting to see the Fox um, IQS going into shocks, and King came out with their smart controller. They're all, I think, using the Bosch ECUs that to manage all this stuff. Like, what's your experience and perspective on smart shocks and dumb shocks? Um, it's pretty epic, man. It's it's definitely so noticeable being able to go from uh comfort sport and then firm um depending on what we're doing and where we're at you know i went on a guy's trip where we went from Lamis north to parker um, which was a couple hundred mile run each way and when you're on that small chattery washboard you know fire road the comfort mo mode will absorb all that stuff and allow you to not feel it but then when you're hauling butt and say there's some washes and there's whoops and whatnot you know, you can click it into sport mode. And if you do come into that, that heavy G out that someone calls out on the radio, you know, you, you hit it, hit it on the fly one more time to firm and it could save your back, you know? Um, so having that is definitely an advantage and super fun to play with, but also, also safe, you know? So it's, it's surprising and it's fun. And it's, uh, I mean, I've let other people drive it and they've said the same thing. They're like, man, the, the noticeability in the different settings is, uh, is more than what people would expect, especially if they've never played with it. So the, the cool thing is that, you know, that system, like the player, the difference between the players is smart shock versus all the new stuff that like the Honda's got it now and the uh, Kings putting it in there is, is, is the Polaris is actually doing multiple adjustments per second, hundreds of couple hundred I think per second or whatever it is um, and they're doing things like you know stiffening the front when you break and and stiffening the side when you corner and and things like that is that noticeable in your in your driving or is it uh, just the fact that it feels stiff or feels plush yeah I mean it's 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 all kind of relative with the setting and um, I don't really notice it as much when I'm like cornering and you're getting that roll and whatnot it's more on the the big versus small bumps you know, but, um, yeah, if it's, if it's giving the computer feedback and it's stiffening the outside and whatnot, I mean, that's, it kind of cross relates with like the sway bar and just the feel of everything. But I don't think it's, I don't think it's as noticeable as the more, more so the bumps, you know, just the overall handling in, in driving fast over whoops and things like that. Yeah. The rigidity of the, of the valving, but not so much the cornering and like, I would say that's less notable, noticeable as the setting is for kind of like how it's dictating the, the role of the car. Now, did you, when you went with the HDR uh, travel kit and all that, did you, did you take it to a long travel? Did you go 72 or did you keep it 64? Like where did that uh, play out? Yeah, we went to the, the 72. We went the long travel kit with their full box set up. Uh, MTS, um, we opened up the shocks and kind of had like a rough gauge of, of what they've done with other Turbo S stuff. Uh, talked with HCR on a spring package that they put on theirs as well. And then we got some iBox springs. We resprung it, put the crossover nuts on there just to where we can adjust it for, uh, for kind of some of the bump zone stuff if we're going to be hitting bigger jumps and whatnot. Um, to set it up to where it's kind of like Megalodon to where we can do everything. We can go have fun on the trail with a comfortable ride, but we can also hit big booter jumps. I mean, we've only revalved it and sprung it once. So I think it could use a little bit more fine tuning, but for hitting it right off the gate with uh, something that hadn't been done um, yet, it was, it was pretty, it's pretty close and things definitely predictable. And I would say pretty safe with our base package, but we're going to get, we're going to get that thing tuned up a little bit more so to where we can go bigger, harder, faster. One of the last videos I saw you post of that uh, unit was you towing the death boat behind it and going off some berms. Uh, was that just a spontaneous, like, hey, I'm going to go hit this, film it? Or was, uh, was that kind of the idea behind it all and uh, going out? Because that 
kind of just blew a whole bunch of people. I shared that with a bunch of people, and they just were like, "What?" And the 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 fact that at the very end you see the people in the back <laughs> in the in the death boat uh, while you're towing it over these jumps. I mean, what was that experience like? I I, I, I coming from my background, I'd be like, I, I'm not going to risk tearing off the hitch of this thing going off this jump. But it sounds like you were pretty confident in the way that was built. Yeah. So I added, uh, I added to the back of that Magnum cage and built, uh, a whole custom hitch set up to where I can put like a drop hitch on it still and tow a standard trailer or whatnot, but made a custom hitch to fit that uniball, just like I did with the bug. And, um, the goal was like, Hey, when we go to the river, I'm going to take the razor. Cause there's also a bunch of trails that require four wheel drive for that. We go and play out, um, in Umar Havasu and, uh, I was like, this is like the ultimate, like, if we need to get somewhere in a tight spot and find like a lake, like I want four wheel drive, this Polaris offers that versus the bug. And it's a little bit narrower. You can squeeze it into places a little easier. And, um, yeah, I, I knew there was a track out there. I knew like, I, I kind of tested the waters with some other stuff. <laughs> we found a little drop off that we hit with, uh, the buddies in the back and they were like, this thing feels like a free runner. It is so buttery smooth. They're like, you're going to bottom out. You're going to probably hurt the razor before you hurt this trailer. And I was like, all right, well, I know there's a little track over here. Let's go hit some whoops. Let's hit some berms. And, uh, there's a little jump too. Let's see what it's got. So we kind of warmed up to it like a couple of laps. And then they're like, go as fast as you want off of this jump, dude. Like, don't hesitate. Quit. Stop, stop pussyfooting it. And I'm like, all right, come around the corner, get into it and get all four tires off the ground. The trailer barely comes off the ground and they're like, go harder, go stronger, go faster. And I'm like, I got to a point where I was hitting it as fast as I could in, in low gear. And, uh, the razors not bought me out, but it's to the point where it was like, again, risk first reward. Like we're already doing things that no one's doing. And I have a couple of my homies in the thing. If anything does go south, like, right we'll call it good. But, uh, then I watched the video and I knew what I felt and saw the video. I was like, it's pretty, pretty sweet. <laughs> well, I, I think you can successfully say you were the first to take a UTV towing a boat off of a jump. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's add it to the list of firsts on the, uh, the shreddy roster. Yeah. And I mean, it was cool that to, to have like just both those like, at the at the launch ramp watching the sunset people pulling their boats off bumping that new rockford system uh put a new full throttle battery in there and had to definitely uh use it from playing the stereo a little too much with that big sub so that thing saved my butt ian that that battery uh sparked her back up and uh yeah it was definitely a head turner out there for sure and it's it's cool to see it people follow the builds and see it all come to life see it work i think we had a little crowd that we generated after jumping everything and then uh yeah just seeing kids take pictures i actually let a few moto boys that i know kids rip that rip the death boat and dude seeing those smiles was was special the thing that's so cool about the pro is that polaris right from the get-go nailed so many things like uh i mean a lot of people don't know this but that thing's already ready for a dual battery you know what we got you it has room for two of them so i mean you could literally jump to almost 50 you know you can jump over 50 amp hour and then you know most staters on utvs are only pushing about 50 uh 50 amps somewhere in there and the and the pros at 75 makes a huge difference so uh, you're you're wearing a shreddy shirt, and uh, Ian, you're wearing a shreddy shirt, and I feel a little bit left out and feel like I didn't join the party. Uh, what uh, can you kind of just? A lot of the guys in the UTV market are they're aware of shreddy, but they're not necessarily you know all in on shreddy. Kind of give us the background on on that. It's, it's, I believe it's you and Aaron's side business, right, where you guys run and operate this on a daily, and uh, it, it's become kind of a, a cultural thing about shreddy life and kind of explain where that came from uh how that all started and uh and what you guys are doing yeah i mean i mean we're going to all these events and vibing and there's just a bunch of little kids that you know always want to take pictures that are that we're giving posters to and stuff and um felt like you know like this is we're kind of creating like a lifestyle like a little culture and uh and it was to kind of portray you know just like 
whether you shred scooters, bikes, skateboards, it's like, like what we've done here in San Diego growing up, the whole, we wanted to kind of encompass that with a brand that, that welcomed everyone of all aspects of action sports, because, um, you know, you see on the internet, a lot of people kind of like taking videos of kids that suck and making fun of them, but that's not what it's about. It's about teaching someone how to do it the right way and, or trying to inform them and uh just enjoy the shred with people around you so i mean um it was something that aaron's helped me with stickers in the past and he kind of had like a clothing company that was called legit and um he just kind of got out of design school and didn't really like his job and was helping me out with design and after urban assault um he helped me with the, the wilkie works logo and stuff and we sold a handful of shirts because people wanted to set up or they're like, where's it go fund me? Because we know you're getting screwed by law. And I wasn't going to take people's hard earned money and not give them something in return. So I said, if you guys want to support the cause, here's a sick urban assault Wilkie work shirt and uh 25 bucks. And I ended up probably not making any money because I gave a lot of them away. <laughs> and uh, what sparked Shreddy was like, you know, you're trying to do something. I'm trying to do something. Um, I don't really feel like I need to put my name on people's backs. Cause I think it's a little cliche. Like, and I was like, what's something we can start that's that's cool, that's positive, that's encompassing, that has to do with like shredding. And uh, like sh- I like it just came to me one night, like while I was just kind of like thinking and thinking and thinking, like because it kind of started bugging me. Like I wanted to start something with him because he'd helped me so much with different avenues and design. And um, the term shreddy came to life and it was like shred ready or like ready to shred kind of blended together you know and then i uh, told them you know let's let's do this together i need you i'll we'll put it in eyes we'll work together on design and color let's kind of keep it retro and old school and fun and uh just family oriented and uh yeah man so that's how it sparked and now we have a warehouse and we have a little bit of a little bit of debt with how much got going <laughs> on going. but but uh i mean it's just like it's like a I, I explain it to people like it's like we throw a bunch of money up in a cloud and we come out with some cool designs and then we let it trickle back down to, to the lake, to the pot. And uh, it's, it's definitely been a lot, a big learning experience and, and just fun to, to be a part of. And he kills it with design and he's a, the big backbone. You know, I, I keep all the vehicles and everything together. He keeps designing and that relationship going with, with those partners and whatnot. Um, for when we're getting new stuff printed and everything, but um, it's cool, man. We have socks, we have underwear, we have shirts, we have hats, we have bikinis coming out. We have a sunglass cloud with heat wave. We've done steering wheels with PRP. We've, we've done just so much cool stuff and uh, the sky's the limit, but uh, it's definitely been a lot of work and it's been fun. It's been rewarding. And like when you see kids tag, you guys, tag us on Instagram wearing shreddy gear, it's like, that's worth more than any dollar amount because they're, they feel like they're a part of something they're, they're ripping and they're doing it not necessarily to show off, but because they enjoy it. So we've, uh, interviewed other small business owners, um, and asked them, you know, questions related to small business. Cause in our industry, uh, there's lots of mom and pop shops. There's lots of guys with smart ideas. There's a lot of guys that are trying to create their own brands, things like that. Is there any kind of takeaway, uh, from your experience in starting Wilkie works and shreddy and shreddy life and all these other things that you've gone through? Is there any, uh, tidbits of wisdom that you can give to the community and say, you know, this is where you need to, um, just rem- remember this when you get to that step or, or this will avoid uh, the big hurdle uh, that you don't see around the corner. Just be prepared for, you know, a lot of work. I mean, when you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to start a business, it takes just so much dedication. It's, it's something that, you know, I've been in the off-road scene since I've been very young. And when I started my first channel with Bill at 16, you know, I was working full-time going to school um, or part-time when I was 16, but um, it just seems like, you're not, I mean, it takes so much hard work, like, and dedication. If you're not willing to put in the hard work and dedication, dedicate yourself entirely to it and kind of half-ass everything, then, uh, dude, it's, it's just going to be stressful because it's, uh, yeah, it's something that everyone's capable of, but I mean, that's why there's few and far in between that actually make it because of the, the, the dedication that it takes. It's like, I'm up every day, you know, usually right about the time the sun's coming up 
to uh, where, and I can get home and the sun's coming down, you know, it's something that, uh, yeah, it's something that just takes discipline and, and just the drive. So just keep charging forward and putting the time in and you'll see results. Do you uh, feel like there's a balance between, cause you know, we see you putting in the wrench hours, but then we also see you out at the lake shredding it up. Like, do you find that there's a required balance for a good mental health state to operate a business at the, at this level? Oh yeah. I mean, you have to find like your, your chi or whatever makes you happy and kind of shuts off, you know, like this weekend didn't have the cameras out rolling, no, no GoPro edits. It was just like phones away. I'm enjoying this with my people. So like sometimes it's not all about, you know, the, the exposure, like the content or whatnot. It's sometimes you gotta, gotta turn that stuff off and just say like set your boundaries you know like i have a spot at the a couple spots at the beach where i'll go and chill with my lady and we'll sit in our hammock and just hang out and vibe together and and talk and chat and um having a good supportive group of friends where you can all work together and uh talk about different things or like ideas and then um yeah but it's it's exciting for me it's fun to to build shit and always strive for more because I feel like as soon as I'm not building or striving for more or challenging myself, then I almost get in a rut. Like, why am I not doing this? Like, why am I not building this? Because like, uh, again, it's, 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 it's a wave. You got to make sure that you're on top of that wave because if you fall back, someone else is going to be stepping up and putting in that time, building something cooler, newer, innovative. So I just want to stay ahead of the curve and then set it up to where I can have all my steeds in one stable and uh, just be comfortable, get to a point where I can hire someone. But until then, full steam ahead and uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. So uh, we've been following uh, you online for a while, obviously, um, with your presence on YouTube and and social. Uh, You've recently started doing the Shreddy Life uh, series, the the video series kind of seems like it's it's taking you back to the to the start and and bringing you forward through multiple episodes can you explain kind of what you're doing there and um what's going on behind the scenes like maybe you got some some stuff in the in the works yeah so uh with Revma media we teamed up with them we have a series that's going to be called shreddy life that's going to encompass and bring in other fellow shredders so the first couple episodes that we did on youtube were kind of like setting the platform and kind of you know, just telling the the beginning of the story a little bit. So, and now we're diving into like uh, a lot more current relative content that'll be going on Mav TV uh, as well as Amazon prime with this quarantine right now. It's set us back a little bit because of, uh, because of just people working from home and having different parties have to communicate. It's making everything in life difficult. So, um, that's still still pushing forward. Bam Bam is still crushing it on edits. He's the one doing uh, doing all the edits. Revma Media, um, Brian, he's the one kind of doing all of the uh, uh, the sourcing for the, the TV show and, and all the back end stuff with that. Um, we did an episode on Mav TV like two years ago when when Brian and I met from Revma, and that thing's still circulating on Mav TV, and I get tagged on it all the time. I know he's capable of pulling it off. Um, and everybody in, uh, in the circle is, is just talented and hungry and they're all, uh, entrepreneurs themselves. And, uh, we're going to make, we're going to make some, some pretty cool, fun content to share with people from King of the Hammers, our summer shred tour and highlight, highlight everyone that we bring into it and not have it be, you know, the Blake Wilkie show. I want to make sure that these other athletes and these other people that are really good and passionate about whatever sport it may entail are kind of like the the stars of each episode. That's rad. The, uh, the community definitely needs more. Uh, I don't want to say community, but communal, uh, exposure. There's so many of us out there that are doing so cool. Blake, if you uh, would you know, uh, kind of touch on adventures uh, or fabrication or background, just kind of where you all around up impact set. into the industry. Um, and a lot of times if you're not um, a pretty face or if you're not uh, Mr. Super Sponsored Athlete Guy, you don't necessarily get the exposure and the content that you're creating, the things that you're doing don't get exposure. So it's super cool to have guys like like Shreddy and, and, and you and what you're doing with um, the content to 
bring that forward and let us all partake in that. Because when we get to partake in it, we get to discuss and be a part of it and live vicariously and, and set our own goals that are bigger and higher and, um, and give us better ideas of what we want to build and, and go do. Uh, one of the biggest things that I've in the, in the past have been a big proponent of is just going out and doing something that you wouldn't normally do. Pushing yourself to the boundary just a little bit giving yourself a little bit of a taste of something different, uh, putting yourself in a little bit of a nervous predicament sometimes just to get your blood flowing, uh, because that's usually what generates uh, growth. And that's usually what generates uh, stories and memories and things like that. A lot of times we just put stuff in the garage and then we never go do something. Um, and, and that's a huge part of our industry is get out, go do it and, and, and shred it up to, to use your, your, your term. Absolutely. I think one thing that I, I really appreciate is just the approachability and stuff. And, you know, there's no shortage of people that I personally know that weekly, monthly, something like that, they're on racedesert.com looking for a class, you know, a, a class 10 that they could bring in and just spend about a year to two years or something tweaking it and building it into some just monster, you know. I think I think you bring that, uh, uh, you, you get people thinking, you know, it's super cool. Oh yeah. I, I know after we built this jet boat, I know uh, a bunch of people are trying to build a jet boat now and I have kids or adults hit me up with questions on that. Um, another big one that we didn't really touch down on if we got time, but, uh, was the Hoonigan building battle series that me and my boy, Kevin, um, built that, that two door XJ. Um, I mean, there's so many people that can relate to an XJ and parts are cheap at portable parts are online. They're, they're everywhere. And, uh, like that build has been cool and that community has been super cool. And, uh, our goal is to, after this quarantine's over is, is keep, keep building small little group events where everyone can, can come and participate in and build that community up and, and document that and, uh, make sure that everyone stays safe in doing so. But, um, yeah, man, it's just, it's cool because as you said, you spark interest and it's, I want everything to be kind of relatable, you know, to, and informative at the same time. So um, that's why, that's where a lot of thought process comes. It's like, let's not make it over extreme unless it's like the TT bug, but everything else relatable, cheap, efficient, effective to where you pick your potion and build something fun and come, come have a good time with us. So you mentioned uh, the pandemic a little bit here and there. Uh, how has that impacted your schedule? There's a lot of events that got rescheduled this year that we were all planning on being at. Um, you know, how has that impacted you and your and the work you're doing? And and then what kind of events do you have coming up? And um, maybe some builds or whatever that you can talk to uh, that we can look forward to this year. Um, where can we see you guys? And and where can we see these these builds? And and also, you know, what can we go watch to uh, partake in this adventure? Um, so, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the adventures and different things that'll come up, I'll, I'll share on my, on my Instagram, uh, as the main platform or my Wilkie works Facebook account. But, um, I mean, dude, it's a, it's, a, it's, I would say affected everybody, man. I mean, uh, with the schedule, especially like, I mean, I, I was really looking forward to race and battle at Pram and, uh, with 11 brothers motorsports, I know they had a couple builds going down with MP and. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to get back out there and race the class 11. Um, mostly currently, I mean, it's, it's taken a toll on a lot of, a lot of businesses with, with sales because of people's maybe cash flow and, and jobs and stuff. So, um, you know, a lot of people, have, a lot of companies have been offering discounts, which is really cool. I know, uh, they just did like a, a bunch of people have gotten together and done different promos to, to give back and then also give back to like different communities and, and or people that are out of work and whatnot. Um, but me, me personally, you know, like a, a handful of sponsors and partners have said, Hey, we got to see how this thing blows over. You know, some of them are smaller businesses, some of them are corporate, you know, and, um, they have to balance everything out just like, like a lot of people do with, with where cash compensation might be going, this and that. And, uh, and, you know, and I'm cool with it, even though it might slow down the TT bug, uh, process, you know, a few months until everything gets back on track and hopefully it does get back on track. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little, it's a little bummed. I'm a little bummed out about it, but you have to, you have to roll with the punches just like, just like they are, you know, you can't point fingers. You can't get upset about it. It is what it is. And, um, 
yeah, man, I hope, I hope this thing bounces back and everyone gets back to normal and, um, we keep charging forward. Yeah. Situations like this is going to reward people that are creative and aggressive, you know? So, so do you have any events coming up, uh, later this year that you can look, we can all look forward to going to that maybe you guys are participating in? Oh yeah. I know, uh, UTV takeover I'm getting, uh, I think this coming weekend we were supposed to be in Virginia, but I know that they're still doing those other three or four events um, in various spots across the country, um, which are super fun. Last year I went with full throttle team and Ian and we had some fun in Oregon. That was my first time going there. And um, just to see how many people were there and we hung out, gave away a ton of stickers and posters with uh, Shreddy and full throttle and uh, just, yeah. So UTV takeovers, obviously we'll be doing the glamorous trips, the big ones like, camp razor and uh you know thanksgiving and probably maybe new year's go superstition or somewhere but we'll try to i know the terror crew boys we had an autolanto thing that we were going to do um that kind of got postponed pushed back so we're going to be working on dates with with that with all the truck dudes and we're going to have pit bike races and side-by-side classes and stuff that way it's it's uh encompassing the whole community and there's you know, you might not be able to afford a big pre-runner, but if you got a pit bike, you know, come race. If not, then bring your kid, come get some free stickers and and uh, hang out and make it to where it's, you know, super cost effective for someone to come and enjoy it and maybe give some ride-alongs and whatnot. Um, I know Rage at the River, I'm trying to race the Class 11 there and uh, just kind of going with the flow. Holly LS Fest, Del Mar at the Off-Road Nights is coming up. So, I mean... Usually I try to keep everyone informed on my IG. So that's probably your best source. Awesome. So where can we uh, find you guys? So you got, uh, you got Instagram, which, which page is on Instagram. So we got shreddy life. I think it's shreddy dot life. And then you have yours. Uh, what's yours? Mine's Blake Wilkie three, five, seven. And then you also have your Facebook page. You mentioned Wilkie works is on, on Facebook. Wilkie works on Facebook. Yep. And uh, then your YouTube channel, you don't have a, a personal one, right? It's just the Shreddy Life YouTube channel? Yeah, we kind of just do everything from our adventures to uh, uh, our adventures to, you know, the, the builds to uh, just the day to day sometimes. If, it, if I feel like it's something that is relatable to our audience and something that, you know, they might be interested in that's not, you know, just repetitive or overkill then uh yeah dude i'll 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 throw new stuff up on there all the time awesome so where where can we find maybe some of those uh other sponsors that are helping you guys create the stuff that are um a little bit in the content game like where can we find more creative uh stuff to entertain ourselves during this pandemic where we're locked inside uh any any tips there i mean there's just so much out there um you know whether it's you know heat we heat heat wave visuals channel that we worked with, with a bunch of that stuff. There's a tear crew page, which has a bunch of different pre runners and fun stuff going on. Um, obviously we work with the Hoonigans depending on, you know, what, what your flavor is. There's, there's just so much out there and I'm sure a lot of people probably already have their niches, but, um, yeah, those, those three are pretty fun and entertaining and there's always new stuff coming out there for sure. Awesome. Well, you know, it's been uh, super awesome to have you on the show uh, today. And I want to really personally thank you for taking the time to spend it with us. Uh, it was uh, nice to see uh, your your humble home behind you with the, the, the boards and everything uh, outside of the garage. Um, I hope that our uh, community enjoyed um, learning a little bit more about you and, and what you're about, uh, where you've come from. And uh, I'm excited to see where this takes you. I mean, this this trajectory of content creation and, and custom builds and all that stuff is is what we all dream about doing ourselves. And so we, we kind of um, like to partake visually and then eventually tr- that trickles down to what we do. So um, it's been super entertaining. It was been, it's been great to get to know you. Um, Ian, do you have anything? Yeah, man, we're we're like two uh, two months, give or take, away from uh, UTV takeover in Coos Bay, and there's been some positive information come out about that event still going off. I hope that's the case. It'd be great to get out there, and it's probably going to be, you know, two months is probably going to be right around the time gloves come off in terms of the social distancing and stuff. So hopefully everything lines up, and we can get out there and have some fun. Down. 
Awesome. Well, uh, again, thank you for coming on the podcast. Uh, this has been episode 14, recorded April 28th, and we hope to have this out this coming Monday. Uh, and so uh, for everybody out there, stay safe. And uh, we hope to see you out on the trails and on the river and uh, hopefully at the uh, events here later this year. From uh, behalf of me and Ian, uh, thanks, Blake. And for everybody else, peace. Peace.